Hi there, and welcome to Bike Fold, the biggest, baddest, bestest bike show in the whole of the country, and the only one dedicated to testing the newest bikes around. I'm Wazza, and here's what's coming up this week. This week, I'll be taking you under the skin of Honda's latest version of their all Fireblade. We'll be out tackling Suzuki's V-Strom, while Louise Brady will be taking a look at BMW's new C1. The 2002 Honda Fireblade. Lordy, what a motorcycle. Because the 1000cc Super Sports class is a very intense place to be these days, where anything less than the very best is soon shown up. But with a genuine 141 horsepower at the back wheel, a positively anorexic dry weight of 168 kilos, and handling and braking to die for, this could be the Fireblade that sets Honda right back at the top of the big four super sports class. Since 1992, when the Fireblade first broke onto the scene and turned the 1000cc super sports class on its head by offering a then unheard of combination of handling and power, the CBR900 Fireblade has well and truly made its mark in the annals of biking legend. Early Fireblades were manic, frisky, powerful things, but ever since then, with each passing incarnation, the bike got, well, not exactly steadier, but a little less mad. And all the while, the competition was just getting stronger. First of all, Yamaha brought out the R1, which stole the Fireblades crown. And then, two years ago, Suzuki came out with the all-singing, all-dancing GSX-R1000, which comprehensively blew the rest of the class into the weeds. And all this meant that although the 2000 Fireblade was the best model Honda had made yet, it was still struggling against everything in the class apart from the ZX-9. Until 2002, that is. Because for this year, the Blade has been on a diet. It's lost some weight, it's got some brand new clothes, nice pointy front end, and check out this tail unit. Beautiful, and it's got a lovely little under tray built in underneath. Then, of course, pièce de la résistance at the back here is the swinging arm. Ten years ago, a swinging arm like this would only have been found on a factory Grand Prix bike, but now you can buy it out the showroom for nine grand, all for yourself. Very nice indeed. Up the front, there are the brakes. Don't look too much different to Firebay brakes of old, but for this year, they've got bigger discs and improved calipers, and they really do work. Best of all. There's another 29 cc's in that motor, which gives us another 20 horsepower to play with. And this is really what has strengthened the Blade's game. Oh yes, the Blade is back, don't be mistaken. But before we go out on the Blade, here's Louise with something a little bit different. Scooter sales have grown steadily over here in the UK over the last few years to the point where they're almost outselling bigger bikes. Now many manufacturers have of course jumped on the bandwagon and not all of them have made scooters before. Many big bike manufacturers and even car manufacturers are trying to get a, a slice of the action. Now this strange looking object is well, what can only be described as a scooter smart car hybrid is BMW's latest innovation. It's called the C1 and really it's a scooter commuter with a roof. The idea behind it was to combine the manoeuvrability and convenience of a motorcycle whilst providing new levels of safety, weather protection and practicality. BMW introduced their commuter back in 2000 receiving a mixed response. On one hand, car magazines hailed it as a great achievement and definitely the cheapest way to own a new BMW. But on the other hand, bike magazines slated it, labelling it pointless. But pointless it isn't, because this scooter is more or less the same width as any other you'll find on the road. But this, like a car, has a roof to keep the liquid sunshine off your helmet. It also has seat belts to hold you firmly in place. And on the top spec models, you'll find things like a stereo, which of course is music to your ears. That's if you can hear it with your helmet on. The C1 is available with either a 125 or 200cc engine, both of which are Austrian Rotax engines, tweaked by the rather clever engineers at the Bavaria Motorworks. The little four-stroke motor churns out 15 and 18 brake horsepower respectively, theoretically giving the C1 fairly strong performance, reaching, wait for it, top speeds of around 65 miles per hour in the 125 guys and 
75 mile per hour for the 200 version. Hold on to your seat. Not bad, but in terms of overall style, the C1 doesn't exactly have the allure of a slinky Italian motorcycle. And let's face it, it can look rather awkward whether it's parked next to another scooter, a motorcycle or a car. You kind of feel as though it should have a bay all to itself. And then of course there's the price, ranging from 3,395 to 4,100. This bike ain't cheap. And you've got to ask yourself the question, do you want to spend one and a half to two grand on a small 50cc scoot? and then spend the rest on waterproofs? Or would you rather ride about in this innovative little machine? Well, as for the performance, well, I want to give it a seven out of 10. It's got a four stroke Rotax engine, which delivers reasonable amounts of power, considering how much weight it has to lug about. It's a heavy old beast. Throttle response is by no means electric, but these bikes shouldn't be judged on their engine performance alone. And the bottom line is that well, it doesn't handle properly, but that's due to its all-up weight and its high centre of gravity. It's almost like trying to take a house round a corner. Ah, the comfort factor. Well, I reckon a pretty respectable 8 out of them due to this lovely soft squidgy seat. It's great if you're on long journeys. Now, if you're a learner rider, you won't miss not having a pillion behind you. And you might even gain some extra confidence from being strapped in by this double crossover seat belt. As for the ride overall, well, visibility is good through the room screen and it feels very smooth. The only problem is it, it feels very big, it, it feels wide and it, it does feel a bit heavy. In fact, it feels so big it reminds me of riding a horse. 9 out of 10 for build quality. BMW are renowned for their finish on the cars and bikes and they've certainly carried that over to the C1 even though this is built in Italy. Alternatives available? Well, I certainly haven't found nothing yet. Value for money? A flat five out of 10, I'm afraid. It's nearly three and a half grand for a 125 scooter. That's almost double the going rate for your average little scoot. Okay, there's not that many of them about, so it may hold the price. And when you think about it, there's a lot of bike and a little bit of car for your Euros. But is it worth it? It's time for the all important street cred. Oh, six out of 10, I'm afraid. I can't say I'm a huge fan of the C1. You see, the problem is, if UK owners could ride the C1 without the helmet, then they'd probably sell them in huge numbers. You can ride it without your helmet anywhere else in the world. After all, that's the whole point of the seatbelt roof thing, isn't it? To allow more freedom riding a bike as you would feel when you were riding in a car. But then again, I suppose you don't have to scrape the dead flies from your visor in the summertime. BMW, well, not really my sort of bike. It's a bit of a ugly looking thing, it's big, bulky. It doesn't really go around corners, really, does it? In my opinion, it's a car. I just just wouldn't be interested in riding one and just wouldn't be seen in one. Well, it's probably a good idea, especially with the weather as it is in this country, but I can't see me riding one, but perhaps in the city it would do quite well. Taking a look at the motor, the figures are very, very strong. There's a genuine 141 bhp at the back wheel, which is just four less than the all-conquering GSX-R Thal. But where the Honda pulls its ace card here for you and I is in the delivery. It's smooth, it's usable, and it is simply easier to get on the gas hard at the track or on the road, where on a GSX-R Thal, you'd always be riding around that severe power kick that it puts in, especially in the mid-range. Basically, what I'm saying is, on the blade, you've got a lot more control over the power on tap, which ultimately makes it the easier bike to ride faster. 
What all this means is a manic rush of warp drive that will turn your insides out and leave pretty much anything this side of the Starship Enterprise floundering hopelessly in your wake. And if you fancy it, there's a genuine 181 miles an hour to be had out of the blade, even if it does say 186 on the clock at the time. But there is a price to be paid for the blade's sharp steering and handling, because the slight trade-off you have here is a little bit of instability. If you're hard on the gas, hit a few bumps, the bike could get a little lively at the front end. What I'm saying is, she's a bit of a slapper, lads, so watch out. If you're the kind of person that's going to really hammer this bike to the full, you're going to want to fit yourself a steering damper. Stick it on, make sure it's an adjustable one, leave it off most of the time, but when you want to go for it, you know it's there, turn it up. Otherwise, kick back and enjoy. That's it for part one. In part two, I'll be back with the blade, Rod Gibson will be on Suzuki's V-Strom, and we'll see you in a bit. Welcome back to Bike File with me, Wazza, and the Honda Fireblade here, which, as you can see, is a very comfortable motorcycle. Granted, you may have a bit of a problem if you wanted to ride it like this, but on a serious note, when you sat on this bike, it's not too cramped, there's plenty of room, and if you want to ride about in town or do some motorway miles, you can do them without being crippled, which is quite unusual for a bike as dramatically focused as this one is. And being a Honda, it's also got some nice little touches like the ever-present Fireblade boot. Granted, if you've got one of these on your car, you might feel a little cheated, but for a super sports motorbike, the space in here is excellent. You can fit a chain in it, you can fit a disc lock in it, there's the little Honda toolkit, absolutely spot on. But before we give you the verdict on the new blade, here's Rod, who's been riding high on Suzuki's V-Strom. Over to you, Rod. What a beautiful day for riding a bike. Not a storm cloud in the sky. If, like me, you're a fan of big trail bikes, you're going to like this. Because big trail bikes just got bigger, badder and meaner. This is the V-Strom. Suzuki's DL1000 V-Strom is the latest entrant into the increasingly competitive big trailing market and as such goes head to head with established market leaders like BMW's R1150GS and Triumph's Tiger, as well as younger pretenders including the Honda Varadero and Aprilia Caponaut. Suzuki have got one up on the lot of them by picking the weirdest name yet to come from a Japanese marketing department. V-Strom sounds to me rather like a typing error and conjures up images of the marketing department having to change the model name when they realise the wrong fairing graphics have been delivered. I'm told by a Norwegian friend that Strom actually means power. Let's see if he's right. Running a slightly detuned version of Suzuki's Monster TL1000 lump, this 996cc water-cooled 90-degree V-twin uses four valve heads and fuel injection to pump out a claimed 96 brake horsepower. And there's power and torque aplenty here, folks. This is a 207 kilogram trail bike that's well capable of giving many a sports bike a good run for its money, while still behaving like a pussycat in traffic. The frame and cycle parts are well up to the job. This massive alloy twin beam frame holding everything together really securely. We've got a conventional alloy swinging arm at the back and right way up forks at the front. Twin pot Nissin calipers at the front and a single one at the rear pull everything down from speed. The tyres say trail wing on them in a nod to the bike's off-road pretensions, but I don't think these are ever going to see anything more than tarmac. Suzuki have had no qualms about going for the jugular in the styling department, and the bike's aggressive stance is highlighted by the predatory looking headlamps and beefy twin silencers that look capable of launching motors at following traffic. Some nice styling touches help finish the bike off. The pattern of bolts around the filler cap echoed around the speedo and tack and repeated around the silencer end caps. On the road, the bike feels surprisingly manageable and can be hurled around like something half its weight and capacity. It's reassuring, forgiving and comfortable and the high riding position lets you exchange nods with lorry drivers 
whilst looking disdainfully down at the swarms of Mondeos beneath you. The vertically challenged may need to enlist the services of a small stepladder to climb aboard, but once you're up there, you won't want to get off. A good practical all-rounder and great fun. It won't quite eat fire blades for breakfast, but it has more than enough power for most of us. Power delivery is strong and a smooth torque curve makes a bike easy to handle in traffic. The chassis and brakes are well up to the job and the bike feels safe and forgiving to ride. For performance, 8 out of 10. This big tall riding position may not suit everybody, but it rivals my favourite armchair for comfort with great vision all around. The fairing is surprisingly effective at speed too, keeping the worst of the wind blast away from all the rider, apart from maybe a little bit to your head and shoulders. For comfort, I've got to give this bike 9 out of 10. Some of the fasteners in the disc centres may begin to rust fairly quickly if neglected, and some of the plastics are a bit, well, plasticky. But paint finish is good, and those stainless exhausts should last almost into the next millennium. For build quality, 6 out of 10. So what do you get for your money? £7,350 on the road, the V-Strom's pretty good value, managing to undercut both the Triumph Tiger, the BMW GS and the Varadero. But watch out for the Yamaha TDM900 galloping up on the inside at just a few pounds cheaper. I think the V-Strom gives you a lot of bike for your money, but you must be prepared for some depreciation. The value, I'd give this bike 7 out of 10. It's a big, mean and tough looking bike that looks like it could crush the opposition with a glance. Only the misspelled fairing graphics mar the image slightly. If Suzuki rebadged it as a V-Storm, I'd have to give it 8. But for the time being, 7 out of 10 for street cred. I've ridden the V-Strom and it's, it's a cracking good bike, it really is. It doesn't encourage you to go too fast and it's um, nice to use in town and very comfortable and really good. I would ride one of them, um, good trail bike, good for going round country roads and, and yeah, very good bike. The V-Strom, very nice bike, um, not my cup of tea really but handles ever so well. Uh, it can tour, it can scratch. It's, uh, that's all you really need out of a big trail bike. Performance. We'll give the Blade a 9. It is a stunning package of power, handling and usability that sets it right at the top of its class. The GSX R1000 may just have the edge on power figures, but chances are you'll go faster on this bike every time. We would have given it a 10, but then where would be Honda's incentive to make it even better for us next year, eh? Comfort. We'll give the Blade a 7 here. It really is very comfortable for a sports bike. That said, pillions aren't exactly going to be your best mates for too long, and maybe you wouldn't want to use it as a dispatch bike. But I've had this one here for 5,000 miles now as a long-term test bike. I've ridden it to France, I've ridden it up and down the motorways, I've commuted across London on it. It's been spot on, really. Just don't expect Goldwing levels of luxury and you'll be fine. Build quality, eight out of 10. What can I say, it's a Honda. The quality is depressingly good. Um, it might be a higher score than that, but until I've seen one of these go through a winter, I wouldn't go any higher than eight. Still, very good. Value for money. It's a tricky one, this, and I'm gonna give the blade a six. Now, if that sounds a bit low, here's why. There's no doubt with one of these, you get a lot of bang for your buck, and the asking price is right in the ballpark with the rest of the competition. But it's only part of the story, because you might find the insurance premiums on a superbike like this will just be out of your reach. So if you can afford the insurance, you're laughing. If not, it doesn't matter about value for money because you can't afford to run it. Street cred. There's no doubt you can big it up and little it down with your massive on the Fireblade. 
It's a bike that carries a lot of credibility and a lot of weight. But I'm still only going to give it seven because in the blue and white colours we got there, it's a little bit sober, isn't it? The lines are still beautiful, the tail section's gorgeous, but maybe needs a bit more pizzazz. Get the red one, credibility shoots straight up to a nine. Firebread, yeah, um, that's my kind of bike, very good, handles well, um, yeah, I'd love one of them. The Honda Fireblade, it's, it's a cracking bit of kit, quality is too fast for me, I can't uh, ride it as quick as it wants to go, but uh, for anybody perhaps a bit younger it'd be a really good bike. More my style of bike, sports bikes, um, good all round racing bike, good for track days, basically it's probably one of the best bikes out at the moment. In next week's show, Louise will be off riding about on the new Sax 800 Roadster. Rod will be off playing with the new Ducati ST4S, which has been beefed up this year with the 996 motor. And I am lucky enough to get a go on Aprilia's new Miele R. Absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. <laughs>